Judge Brett Kavanaugh. A president is not above the law with respect to the criminal process. Judge John Roberts. I believe that no one is above the law under our, under our system, and that includes the president. Judge Neil Gorsuch. And nobody is above the law in this country, and that includes the president of the United States. Judge Samuel Alito. No person in this country, no matter how high or powerful, is above the law. Judge Amy Coney Barrett. No man is above the law. Lying liars that lie. This is Fuse Box number 253. Dictum, and you have flimmed your last flam. It's a disgrace what you're doing to me. No one has ever been treated like this in the history of the universe. Sure, sure, I'm a malignant narcissist and want to be dictator. But what about the rigged election? And we did win the election. What about the billions and billions of people coming into our country every second from the border? What about that? Droves of filthy, scummy, drug-addicted rapists and murderers. And this legal system is just out to get me. I did nothing wrong. 34 times. No, it was a perfect con. I, I, I mean, business transaction. It was just a legal expense. That's all. So what if I slept with a porn star? Admit it. You're jealous, aren't you? Sure. You'd love to have played hide the bratwurst with a porn star. Yeah. It's because it's me. I'm the victim here. Not them. Not the state of New York or the people of this great country. No, no. It's me. I did nothing wrong ever. I'm being witch hunted. It's me, I tell ya. I'm the victim here. There has never been another... Well, you know, I, I'd say you've had your day in court. Not by a long shot. Well, yeah, true, true that, yeah. Uh, hello, friends, and uh, welcome in to this, the 253rd edition of Fusebox, revealingly entitled Dictum. And uh, more about that in a moment. I'm your seemingly judicial but secretly writing more paperless orders to uh, delay the proceedings host... Mark Rose, <laughs> and over there... Yeah, for all the law students in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a scholarly crowd, to be sure. And uh, over there, a virtual still life of audio empowerment. The Archbishop of Amplitude, Milt Keynes, everybody. Well, thank you kindly. Uh... Not going to ask where this title came from? <laughs> no, because it came from you. Well, no, it came from Pollard. Ah. But he sent it over to me, and, and I cracked up and thought this would be perfect for a show title. Yeah, well, it, it is for sure. And uh, would you like to explain it to our uh, intrepid listener, Mr. Keynes? Sure, sure. It's easy. It's a person who plays the victim, but is really just a dick. Succinct as that, friends. And uh, we know one in particular who falls neatly into that category, do we not? And the rest of the maganoids just deny the living shit out of everything. Never even acknowledging the truth or take any responsibility for anything. Such is the complexion of the present society. It's rather desiccated and somehow crunchy. You know, uh, I'd have that looked at. Good plan. W uh, welcome to what may well have become the Kingdom of the United States, as the Supreme Court has uh, taken uh, another giant leap towards uh, totalitarianism. Just the damn craziest thing I have ever heard of. Do you realize that this uh, just creates a kind of loop system that ensures that the president can never really be held accountable for anything because it can be an official act. Indeed, yeah. As our uh, pre-roll demonstrated, these four now Supreme Court justices all committed perjury at their confirmation hearings, stating clearly for the record, 
that the uh, president is not a king or a lord god emperor. He or she is a human subject to the same laws as you and me. Yeah, and they have a hell of a time dealing with that logic. Well, perhaps it's because they've been... Their ticket is definitely punched. Well, on this edition of the show, we have some uh, interesting factamenta to share with you. Uh, like, for instance, an entry in the Hot Wire of Science series dealing with some advancements in robotics that will uh, uh, interest you, for sure. There's some disturbing news regarding your mail. <laughs> and whom might be reading it? Yes, and but also, we have a piece from our buddy 42nd Street Pete and his Grindhouse Minute, this time one of the classic Jack Hill-directed women in prison movies of all time, The Big Bird Cage from 1972. Oh, I'm in. Of course you are. And uh, when we return, just a quick thought or nine on the recent presidential debate. So, join us. Or are we? Anything in the house is yours. You know, it's no secret, I'm a big fan of the Grindhouse period of cinematic history, and nothing covers these times and events better than Grindhouse Resurrection magazine. For one thing, the folks who write for it have first-hand experience with what they're writing about. They were actually there, maybe even created some of the films we're talking about. Like in issue number two, a rather scathing and wonderfully insightful article on the BS on Blu-ray. Not everything on that format should be. And in an article by Richard Tater, he outlines a few of the direct-to-video films that probably didn't warrant the restoration, or for that matter, the hefty price tag. I'd call that a public service. So will you. Pick up a copy of Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine. Info on ordering your copy is in the show description. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Clearing your browser won't help. TheFuseBoxShow.com All righty, friends. Uh, we're back at it. Uh, uh, can I just take a minute to comment briefly? on the uh, debate from the other night between the former president of these United States and the uh, current one. Sure. You have the podium. I saw what you did there. King of continuity, they call me, bro. Well labeled. Uh, so, in the spirit of true transparency, friends, I avoided watching that thing. Really? Yes, yes. My hunch was that it would be a perfect Cringe fest. And, uh, well, <laughs> judging by the clips that I ended up seeing, it was worse. Yeah, it was a tough watch. Uh, Biden struggled for sure. Well, and, and of course, the, the, the orange guy was, well, exactly what we know him to be. A liar. Too many to count, bro. You'd need some kind of quantum computer to keep up with all the completely batshit crazy things he claimed as being a fact. Yet, in spite of all that, this is clearly not the first time that a future president did poorly on one of these things and uh, came back to clinch it. Obama was one such chap. The first one for him was a wee uneven. He seemed a bit unprepared for some of the twists and turns of the debate. But uh, in the long run, as we know... It didn't matter. Bro, I sure hope you're right. This was a stinking truck tire fire of a debate. If I was coming into this thing knowing nothing about either of these two guys and watching this horror show, I'd be packing for Canada. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, and, and to add uh, uh, to that migration event potential, Mr. Keynes, may I just say, as a sidebar here, with the recent determination by the Supreme Court that presidents have total immunity now in cases of carrying out, quote, official acts, the classic example being the theoretical hiring of, yeah, SEAL Team 6 to execute a political rival because you fancy them enemy of the state, to put it one way. Well, perhaps then, our uh, current president should take a look at the 
exceedingly right-leaning justices of the Supreme Court who are demonstrating clearly to be a threat to democracy as it stands today and use these newfound powers of immunity to clean house. Make it look like a tragic bowling accident? Might work. I mean, he is immune from prosecution. It's a thought. I digress. So given the things at stake again in this upcoming election, most of us will have really little choice but to, hopefully, side with simple logic and not with the guy who has designs on dismantling this democracy on day one. And the Supreme Court just seems to believe that taking revenge out on all who have, at least in his demented mind, uh, wronged him is perfectly fine as well. You know, he is now, as you said, Lord God Emperor of the USA. They they seem clearly to be hell-bent on creating a monarchy in this country. One that, uh, as we recall, friends, the founders of this country, <laughs> escaped from to establish uh, this new idea called uh, democracy. Uh, I'm also really, really hoping that this will be the end of the old guy choices? I mean, seriously, I get it. Experience is valuable, can, in some cases, instill wisdom even. But at some point, it's just not smart or safe even. Well, I'd say let's extend that into Congress as well. You know, there are some folks in there that seem to have been around since the invention of steam locomotion. True. Yeah. It's it's really time for a shakeup, friends. And uh, we can assist in that process by getting out there and voting. Seriously, this is how it changes virtually everything. We've seen it demonstrated in vivid technicolor in the last two congressional elections. I still say, in as much as legacy media wants to sell this, uh, 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 the economy as being the big factor. Boy, howdy, do they. Yeah, and it is a factor for sure. In this race, though, I still say... It's about women, women's rights to have control over their own bodies for dog's sake. Don't ever underestimate that power at the poll or (laughs) you shall once again rue the day. Now available in plaid flavor. Friends, you may be interested to know that your male the sort that comes to your mailbox, sometimes referred to as snail mail. Yeah, but the snail lobby put a kibosh on that one, though, bro. You can get canceled for saying it now, I'm told. Really? Yeah, who who told you that? Oh, banana slug. You're canceled. Oh, 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 well, well, they they ought to know, certainly, yeah. Yeah, so a a disturbing report came out from the USPS, but uh, reported by the Washington Post, says that the USPS have shared information from thousands of Americans' letters and packages with law enforcement every year for the past decade, conveying the names, addresses, and other details from the outside of boxes and envelopes without requiring a court order. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Postal inspectors say they uh, fulfill such requests only when mail monitoring can help find a fugitive or investigate a crime. But a decade's worth of records provided exclusively to the Washington Post in response to a uh, congressional probe show Postal Service officials have received more than 60,000 requests from federal agents and police officers since 2015 and that they rarely say no. Each request can cover days or weeks of mail sent to or from a person or address, and uh, 97% of the requests were approved, according to the uh, data. So uh, postal inspectors recorded more than 312,000 letters and packages between 2015 and 2023. And that's what the uh, records currently show. Uh, Okay, I think I get it, but... Yeah, it's 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 a wee bit disconcerting. Uh, This uh, surveillance technique, by the way, it's known as the Mail Covers Program, 
and uh, has long been used by postal inspectors to help track down suspects or uh, evidence. The practice is legal, and the inspectors say they share only what they can see on the outside of the mail. The Fourth Amendment requires them to get a warrant to peek inside. Is this another case of uh, to hell with the Constitution because we're not using it anyway? Well, <laughs> well, according to the Postal Service's uh, law enforcement arm, the uh, U.S. Postal Inspection Service, it's traditionally declined to say how often it facilitates these requests, saying in a 2015 audit that such details would decrease the program's effectiveness by, quote, alerting criminals to how the technique works. Okay, I, I get that. But still, it, it seems to me there should be a halfway compromise, yeah? Well, to that point, Mr. Keynes, in a letter in May 2023, a group of eight senators, including uh, Ron Wyden, Rand Paul, and Elizabeth Warren, urged the agency to require a federal judge to approve the requests and to share more details on the program, saying officials there had chosen to, quote, provide this surveillance service and to keep postal customers in the dark about the fact that they had been subjected to monitoring. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, in a response earlier this month, the uh, chief postal inspector, Gary Barksdale, declined to change the policy, but provided nearly a decade's worth of data showing that postal inspectors, federal agencies, and uh, state and local police forces made an average of about 6,700 requests a year. And uh, that inspectors additionally recorded data from about another 35,000 pieces of mail a year. Now, Barksdale said in a letter to the senators in June of uh, last year that the program was, quote, not a large-scale surveillance apparatus <laughs> and was focused only on mail that could help police and national security agencies carry out their missions and uh, protect the American public. The practice, he added, has been legally authorized since 1879, a year after the Supreme Court ruled that uh, government officials needed a warrant before opening any sealed letter. Uh, Barksdale says, There is no reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to information contained on the outside of mail matter. Our senator here from Oregon, uh, Ron Wyden, said uh, in a statement, quote, These new statistics show that thousands of Americans are subjected to warrantless surveillance each year and that the Postal Inspection Service rubber stamps practically all of the requests they receive. He uh, also criticized the agency for refusing to raise its standards and require law enforcement agencies monitoring the outside of Americans' mail to get a court order, which is already required to monitor emails and texts. It, actually, back in 1978, a circuit court judge said the mail covers could expose someone's personal life in a manner unobtainable even through surveillance of his movements, rendering the subject's life an open book. No kidding. So, clearly, the, the, the smart solution here is the one suggested uh, by the eight senators. Get a court order. This does nothing to alert the, quote, suspect of uh, anything more than any other judicial process like this. Something to consider. The hot wire of science. You know, there was a time that uh, this idea was uh, the subject of certain dystopian science fiction movies or even, uh, <laughs> as I recall, an episode of Black Mirror, which uh, recently did a story very similar to this one that's emerging. So, friends, the United States and China appear to be locked in a race to weaponize four-legged robots for military applications. Oh, holy carp. You know, I, I've seen those Boston Dynamics videos, and they scare the crap out of me. Well, get ready for some more nightmares, Mr. Keynes, because the Chinese military recently unveiled a new kind of battle buddy for its soldiers, a, quote, robot dog with a machine gun strapped to its back. Yeah, I'm out. In video distributed by the state-run news agency CCTV, People's Liberation Army personnel are shown 
operating on a testing range alongside a four-legged robot with what appears to be a variant of the standard issue QBC-95 assault rifle mounted on it as part of China's recent Golden Dragon 24 joint military exercises with Cambodia in the Gulf of Thailand. So in uh, one scenario, Chinese soldiers stand on either side of the doorway while the robot dog enters the building ahead of them. In another, the uh, robot fires off a burst of bullets as it uh, advances on a target. And one Chinese soldier shown operating the robot said, it can serve as a new member in our urban combat operations, replacing our members to conduct reconnaissance and identify the enemy and strike the target during our training. But wait, there's more. Great. Not to be outdone, friends. In the past year, the Pentagon has experimented with outfitting quadrupedal ground robots with its standard-issue M4A1 carbine, the XM7 rifle that the uh, U.S. Army is in the process of adopting under its next-generation squad weapon program, and even the M72 light anti-tank weapon that's been in service with American troops since the Vietnam War. So just weeks before the CCTV published its uh, footage of armed robot dogs in action, Marine Corps Special Operations Command revealed that it was experimenting with adding mounted gun systems based on defense contractor Onyx's artificial intelligence-enabled Sentry remote weapon system to its own mechanized canines. American defense officials have been quick to emphasize that the development of weaponized robot dogs is, at this stage, purely experimental, intended to help military planners, quote, explore the realm of the possible. As you might expect, the uh, public reception <laughs> to weaponized robot dogs is overwhelmingly defined by concern mixed with discomfort especially given the rise of uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous weapon systems that can independently track and identify targets. You think? Well, like I was mentioning in the intro to this piece, many folks are, 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 uh, are citing the Black Mirror episode with these, you know, marauding hordes of rogue robot dogs equipped with serious weaponry and, and then targeting humans. <laughs> Now, according to Sam Bendit, uh, an analyst at the Virginia-based Center for Naval Analysis, it's a, a think tank whose uh, research focuses on robotics and unmanned systems, while uh, a footage of armed robot dogs may alarm the average observer, he says, these systems are currently nowhere near agile or versatile enough to make practical sense on chaotic battlefields. He goes on to say that I had a chance to operate a robot dog at an AI conference in the Netherlands last year, and it doesn't have the same dexterity you would expect from a quadruped. It's not quite as dexterous, as flexible, or as fast in how it operates. Apart from videos of them doing push-ups and stuff like that, it doesn't run. It can maybe jog, but it can't even make a turn quite as fast as the tracked or wheeled unmanned ground vehicle. Yes, they're neat. They're cool, Bendit says. But show me a video of a pack of these moving on their own through a forest, not just walking by tapping their feet at every step, but actually jogging between trees the way I would with a dog. Then we'll get to the point where these are actual combat dogs. Cool. Neat. Yeah, that's a, that's a big no-go, Sam. Well, it's in, quote development, and uh, probably an eventuality at some point. Well, the other thing is, if they're developing this and telling us about it, what the hell else is actually working now that they're not telling us about? Eh, cheery thought. Well, to leave it not with the robo-dogs of war... Let's go to the birds in cages, shall we? We've got another grainy gem from our buddy 42nd Street Pete and a grindhouse minute. This one features 1972's women in prison classic, 
the big bird cage. Take it away, Pete. Meet the girls of the big bird cage, enslaved to every cruel whim and desire of a ruthless madman. Punished by the terrible machine that maims tender bodies and cripples innocent young minds. Let me die! Denied the one thing which would make their life bearable, their overheated passions burst forth in a wild rampage of vengeance and destruction. And now it's time for another Grindhouse Minute with 42nd Street Pete. This is 42nd Street Pete bringing you a Grindhouse Minute. The Big Bird Cage, 1972. I mean, the first one was the Big Doll House, and Sid Haig had a minor part, and Pam Greer was in it. But this one, they became, and even Jack Hill says that, this became his Tracy and Hepburn, you know, uh, Pam and, and Sid. Pam's a revolutionary. She's got to get locked up in prison to get all the girls out. And Sid gets hired as a guard, but all the guards are gay, so he has to fake being gay. And the guards are Vic Diaz and this other big, rough-looking guy. And Vic's completely out of his mind and mincing and everything like that. There's a lot of action in this. I think Carol speeds in it, too. The big birdcage is a sugar grinder, and chicks are get crushed in it and stuff. And, yeah, there's a lot of shooting, a lot of violence. And, you know, unfortunately, they don't make it to the end. But, you know, it, it's, it's sort of established a partnership because they work together a lot, you know, with these films. You know, the big dollhouse, the big birdcage. Um, Black Mama, White Mama. Pam wasn't in Savage Sisters, but Sid was. Yeah, there was a lot of work over there, and you know the, the, the films were good. I actually, you know, I enjoyed every one of them, to be honest with you. Stay safe. We'll catch you on the flip side. I love this one. You think we can get Pete to cover one of the uh, Ilsa She Wolf of the SS films, though? Well, you know, I'll tell you what. We might just do that ourselves. Uh, Mr. Pollard says he's up for a viewing. Yeah, well, we, we sort of corrupted him with uh, Love Camp 7 a while back. Maybe maybe he's seeing the light. Nah, nah. nah. nah he would, that's well, uh, thanks to Pete for another stellar Grindhouse excursion, and he'll be back next month with a film I've never seen, but uh, have heard about for years. From the uh, decidedly far east of center and Staten Island's very own, the one and only Andy Milligan. The film? Fleshpot on 42nd Street. (laughs) Don't you dare miss it. And uh, with that, we'll uh, gather up our whiny, self-involved, and totally distorted views of our own reality and sleaze off to a Republican convention doomed to failure. But not before thanking our contributors to this one, Aaron Lane and Gregory Wilson for extremely profound, with a side of glorious, ideifications. Thanks as well to 42nd Street Pete for another grainy jaunt down the deuce for his Grindhouse Minute feature. And thanks as always to the intermural man of mixage, Milt Keynes for technical assistance and so forth and so on. Another true slice. And uh, folks, you can really help make a difference around here and get some free swag at the same time by uh, becoming a member of our Patreon clan. Yes, sir. Free swag, early releases, exclusive content, and untold secrets of the ages revealed to the fortunate and foresighted folks who sign up. Patreon.com forward slash The Fusebox Show will get it all started. You'll you'll be so glad you did. As will we. Thanks bigly with tiny, tiny hands to our friends at Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine for the continued support. And check them out at 42ndStreetPete.net for all the details therein. And, of course, thanks to you, friends, for pushing play on this edition of the show. We'd probably just be walking in circles in an abandoned little general convenience store parking lot. Yeah, that would just be ugly as fuck. Yes. Yes, it would. I have been your modeled on the actual facsimile of an imitation host, Mark Rose, saying, until our next cartoon.
few.